Hello, Miss Diropoulos. It's a pleasure to have you here for, uh, with us for the Atlantic Dialogues. Uh, before we delve into our discussions, I just want to present you briefly. You're the chief executive of the South African Institute of International Affairs. It's a pleasure to have you here. You have um, an expertise that's spanning over two, de two decades on uh, development aid, South-South uh, cooperation, and uh, the role of emerging powers in, in Africa. And obviously also, you're, a, you're, you're an avid commentator of uh, South African foreign policy. But today, what I want to talk about is the de development cooperation. Um, so my, my first question is that um, as, a, as a researcher in, uh, in, in the Sahel, uh, as an expert on the security development nexus, I see that uh, there is a, a reform, a, a will and desire of the reform of the, of the paradigm, even the paradigm, the core, the essence of development aid, uh, a, a desire to change it from African states. Um, the, the president of Senegal, Macky Sall, has, uh, has advocated strongly to, to reform this development aid. Uh, many, many African countries are, are trying to advocate for, for a change of the paradigm, a change of the relationship in terms of development aid. Uh, as, a, as a researcher, as, a, as someone who's been working on this for the past two decades, how do you interpret this desire? I think it, it is linked uh, very fundamentally to the growing African agency, sort of taking control of our own future as a continent, as individual countries, uh, and taking control over our own development. Yeah. But this happens, this plays out, obviously, also against the background of a very changing global economic system. Let's not yeah. even go to the geopolitics of it, which has also highlighted, and, and that's, that highlighting has probably become much more apparent over the last 10, 12 years since the global financial crisis, oh. that the particular development paradigm globally and development aid as a dimension of that uh, doesn't factor in yes. both some of the newer global challenges, as well as the fact that while development cooperation has helped in, in certain specific areas, we haven't seen the, the a real impact, a real impact in, in many, not only African countries, but other countries of the developing South. Sure. And certainly no country, uh, I think, of the developing South has become... Uh, more developed, more developed because of development aid. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's about many more things, yes. uh, something which I think African countries also over the last 20 years have, become to, have begun to realize more. Yeah. It's about also how your own domestic policy frameworks are structured. Yes. It's about your governance and so on. But I think one other point that is important is that, uh, you know, and this, this also came out of the, of, of, of the global financial crisis, is that the global economic system uh, and globalization yeah. Yes, has created phenomenal growth. But not for all. But not for all. And the inequality dimension of our global economic system is yeah. the fundamental problem. Yeah. Yes. And in that context, we really need to think about the global superstructure and how it enforces and entrenches inequalities yes. between North and South, but I would also argue between poor and rich, even in rich countries. Yes, yes. And I think that's, yeah. that's, that's underpinning. Yeah, in, indeed, indeed. It's, it's quite interesting to, to link the development aid to inequality and, and ask the question quite bluntly, is development aid just a, a moral boon to, to justify the global inequalities and, and how globalization has created wealth in the North and not so much in the South? Uh, so thank you for this, this analysis, and, and it's good to, to say that uh, the development of African states is multidimensional. It's not just about development aid, it's just one part of it, it's not all the answer. And um, also, um, I see that you reckon this more vocal Africa, you say that in your experience you can see that uh, Africa has been more vocal in the international stage, but yet yeah, we can see that uh, there is no African country, African country in, on the Security Council. I know that South Africa is advocating uh, quite strongly for a seat there, uh, two seats even, two seats for African states given, given the, the, the tremendous uh, wealth of, of experience and countries in the African continent. So uh, as an international community here, as, as think tankers, how how can we uh, make uh, this voice more heard? How, as an international community, uh, can we build platforms for these voices, these African voices in the international scene uh, to be more um, impactful? So, talking specifically about, about think tanks, and then I'll move more broadly yeah, to the international sure. community, I think it is so important for African think tanks, uh, in particular, uh, to become to increase their involvement yeah. in global platforms and on global issues. 
In other words, you often hear, if we talk about development, you hear a lot of uh, sort of global north institutions focusing on development, talking about Africa and its developmental yeah. challenges or, or, the, de or the, the concerns of the global south. <clears throat> but we need to increase our voices. Uh, we need to ins make sure that we can insert our voices into all the relevant uh, global platforms. Just to give you an example, if you look at the G20, yeah. another uh, uh, forum where uh, President Macky Sall of Senegal said Afri the African Union should be given should a be permanent yeah. seat rather than being a visitor. Yes. Um, uh, the G20 discusses a lot of issues that have a direct impact on Africa's development, whether it is about the global financial system or about energy transitions and, and climate change, whether it's about health pandemics, etc., doesn't necessarily always take the decisions, but it acts as a very important platform for developing consensus to move into other more formal global governance sure. forums. So one of the things we really need to build up, and I think this is a critical time now, we've just come out of the Indonesian G20 presidency, we're yes. going into the Indian, Brazilian, and South African G20 presidencies. We really need to build up the developmental agenda of the G20, and we need to have more African voices on it. And this is something that yes. we at the Institute um, are also walking, working towards. The Atlantic Dialogues is another, is yes. another way of, of, oh, sure. of, sure. of, of, re of creating that resonance. But I think what is critical from an international uh, community perspective is that first and foremost, more African voices or, or, uh, are not necessarily going to be given the space. They're not going to be granted the space. Yes. We have to insert ourselves yes. into it as yes, states, sure, yes. absolutely, as states, as, as the AU and so on. And what is important there is that we need to then think very carefully as a continent about the kind of capacity we need to create within our bureaucracies in order to be able to participate meaningfully yes. in the policy yes. debates. It's, the first thing is to have a seat at the table. Okay? Yes. You know the, the, the point that they make, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Yes. <laughs> but you also have to be, if you're going to be at the table, uh, you also have to have the right cutlery yes. to participate in the meal. Yes. Yeah. And, and meaningfully uh, shape the conversation. And I think there sometimes, even when we have a seat at the table, we're not necessarily fully uh, engaging, equipped. equipped is probably the better word, uh, to, to really also push our agenda in a way that secures some sort of outcomes yeah. that reflect our... That, I think that also comes from the fact that uh, the African Union has uh, been funded by external actors. Uh, our bureaucracy in the African continent has still hasn't uh, shown some unity and we still uh, haven't been able as an African continent to, to, co to go into this international scenes united with a united agenda. So I think um, uh, we can blame uh, the North, we can blame external actors, but we also have to look at our, ourselves and see how uh, these voices that are more and more vocal, uh, can, how can we capitalize on them? How can we unite them? How can we make them more sound? And also how can we be equipped enough so that when we are we're at the table, we can say, here are the topics and here are the things that we want on the me menu. We want reform of development aid. We want institution. We want to focus on this. We want to focus on that. We, we want to have our own uh, opinions and narratives uh, about the international uh, community, about climate change, about the economic system. And I think as, a, as an international community, as an African international community, that, that's what we, we crave. So it's critical to to know what we don't want, but also what we want. So exactly, yeah. Proposals on the table. yeah. Not like we want to reform. Yes. Well, this is what yeah. we're proposing exactly. in terms of very yeah. specific, uh, so that they then yeah. need oh, to be for sure. specific, for sure. for sure. rather than allowing yeah. them to get away with this. Yeah, we, we often say there is no fav favorable wins to, to, to the one who doesn't know where, we, where, he, where he, exactly. he's going. <laughs> So, for sure, for sure, I think there's a, a big discussion on the on the AU level to have between South Africa, Morocco, between all the regions of the African continent, in order for us to to unite to have a united voice. So, my last question is going to be on the North-South uh, relationship. <clears throat> I want to know how can we equalize it? Uh, how can we uh, build bridges? Uh, you know that we we pride ourselves in, in in this conference, the Atlantic Dialogues, to bring the North and the South and and to have fruitful debates, fruitful discussions, uh, it, on an equal uh, manner. So how can we, on in the international community, uh, build grounds and and soil for a more uh, fruitful, uh, equal, and respectful relationship between North and South? 
So I think the first thing we obviously always have to recognize in, in these kinds of north, north, in the north-south relations is that often there is an asymmetry. Yes. And that asymmetry also reflects, uh, speaks to the points we, we made earlier about uh, sort of African countries or the global south not always, not all of the countries in the global south being fully equipped yeah. uh, to engage very, very specifically on, on key yeah, global on key uh, key uh, uh, debates. And so the first point about greater equalization is, is that it's, it's, you know, we cannot, we cannot go into, into discussions, into summits, of which we have a lot in Africa. Everybody yeah. wants to have a summit with yes. Africa, and I would argue that that sometimes is, yeah. actually doesn't necessarily move us yes. forward. But when we, when we go into these, these discussions, in terms of how we set the agenda, or how the agenda is set, we need to ourselves be very proactive. Yeah. Uh, sometimes what happens, if you look at some of the relations with the European Union or with others, is you know they make a proposal on, on yeah. particular sets of issues, and we say, you know, I think well, there's been a lot of pushback in the last couple of years, yes, particularly yes. on climate change. But we often say, okay, yeah, this this is fine, this is fine. But I think, can we, as, as an AU, and I recognize that this is always difficult because you're dealing with 54 yeah, so countries. Many countries. But can we as an AU be much more um, proactive, proactive and assertive yeah. in the agenda and how that agenda is populated? Yeah. Yes. So that's the first thing about creating greater equalization. Mm -hmm. The second one really is, is, is not necessarily about equalization, but about the bridges that we cannot cut off. Yeah. conversations. We cannot cut off dialogues, yes. particularly in, a, in an environment where we're becoming geopolitically, the, the, the world is becoming uh, more, more, tense. More, more tense and yeah. more polarized. Yes. Those bridges, which sometimes may be asymmetrical, you know, I don't think we can ever yeah. remove but the asymmetry, but they have to be reinforced, they have to be solid. Yes. Um, th those bridges become even more, uh, uh, more critical. Yeah. So that's important. Let's not burn any bridges. Yes. <laughs> okay? yes. Let's yes. build them. Uh. But also critically important that I think we as Africans have to reflect on this is the fact that as we move into this more politic, polarized uh, geopolitical environment, we have to ask ourselves the question, does this mean that we're going to be pulled in one or another direction, exactly, into yeah. one or another yeah, camp? A, a Cold War type of, uh, of uh, rhetoric. Yeah, as things become much more... Yes. And clearly we don't want that, and there's been a lot of talk, certainly in South Africa, about the importance of non-alignment, but we need to think about what that means. Exactly. Yeah. Because we also don't want to be neutral or yes. disengaged. Non-alignment is not disengagement, it has to be a, a proactive position. Absolutely, and I think how we do that uh, is something we really need to focus on oh. in the, in, in, I would say in the short term, because yes. I think events are moving very rapidly. I completely agree. Um, I think you're, you're expanding the discussion about uh, geopolitics, about one of your areas of expertise, uh, which is competing emerging powers in Africa. Uh, I think we're seeing more and more uh, countries close off, go into military regimes, and um, this... Um, the consequence of this is that they burn the bridges that we, we were talking about. We can talk about Mali, we can talk about Burkina Faso. And obviously we don't want uh, autarchic uh, regimes in Africa. We need to unite. There's uh, the ASFTA, there's the AU, there's a lot, a lot of competing international initiatives to, uh, to show this political will of a strong, powerful, united Africa. But we still on the ground see that some countries have um, unlawful regime change that hinder this... Uh, this uh, 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 path towards unity. Uh, my, my, my last question, I'd love to talk for hours with you, but, but we, we have to limit it to, to a 15 minute interview. Uh, I, I wanna know if you have some conclusions, some last recommendations for, for our viewers. I, I think uh, you've already touched on a, on a couple of important <clears throat> things. We as, as, as African states have taken some steps in the direction of of taking control of our own development. And I just want to, to linger for a moment on your point about the African continental free trade area. I think it's moved very quickly uh, in, in a short period of time, but it is, it's still embryonic. Yeah. And creating the, uh, the, the foundation for meaningful intra-African trade requires us to build regional value chains. Yeah. I think, I would say that it's, probably true of many countries in Africa that that concept still needs to be understood and unpacked a little yes, better. Yes. 
and to recognize also the important role that the private sector can play in that, oh, that you sure. cannot have these conversations yes. devoid of any exactly. private sector yeah. input exactly. in, and that you have to create hubs and yeah. spokes that feed into a particular sure. value chain, whether sure. it's automotive or pharmaceutical yeah. or whatever. And we need to move quickly on that. Yeah. I mean, that's the one point. And the last point really is on unconstitutional changes of government. You know, the AU, and in fact, it was the OAU when it took that decision in 1999, yeah. Uh, that, you know, it would yellow card them. And I suppose yes. using that term yes. today is yes. opposite, given the World Cup. Given the World Cup is happening. <laughs> um, that, you know, and we have, I think, for, for a good, on many occasions, the AU yeah. has, um, has observed uh, that yellow card uh, approach. Yeah. But in other cases, it hasn't. And I think we have, as an AU, have a set of, of, of norms, agreements, yeah. charters. We need to keep to them. We need to be, uh, to be consistent yeah. in the application of certain rules like a constitutional sure. changes of government. And, and those are yeah. the two points I would... I yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Deropoulos. It was, it was really a, a very interesting conversation on, on development aid and, and the, the change of paradigms between North-South relationship. It was a pleasure. It was great to be chatting to yeah. you. Thank you so much.